Who I am, like where I've been or what I used to be, is not important. Enough to know I've never been anywhere and returned empty-handed. I've made calls, and those calls have been returned, if you know what I mean. I have files people would die for. Maybe some have already. I'm a devotee of dishonorable data. I detect disgrace. I log lies. I bank bad behavior. And I scrutinize scandal. Then and now. A young boy plucked randomly off the street, taken out, kidnapped, and killed. And the fact that the boys who killed him were also young, in fact, geniuses, with IQs of 160, 220, coming from wealthy families, uh, why would they commit such a crime? This isn't simply uh, a murder case. This is a, a morality play for the 1920s, for modern times. It foreshadowed so many other things in our society, and if you think about it, it really did. It kind of gripped America into looking for maybe the first time in our century at the dark side of life. I've been to Beverly Hills. The streets are clean. In 1991, a couple of kids from there hit the papers big time. Eric and Lyle Menendez were nailed for killing Jose and Kitty, their parents. The press and the cops went wild. The first trial had two juries, one for each Menendez. Both juries ended up deadlocked. They couldn't decide on guilt or innocence. The second trial took six months and ended in conviction for both boys. Although eligible for death sentences, Eric and Lyle are doing life without parole. In the 1920s, two rich and smart Chicago kids stalked a neighborhood boy and killed him with a chisel. Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb may not have been brothers in fact, but they were brothers in blood. Loeb and Leopold were, in a sense, the first juvenile delinquents. Here were these kids who had everything. They were uh, students at the University of Chicago. They came from wealthy families. And it was fantastic to think that, you know, people from this strata in society would rebel in such a really a horrendous and shocking way. It was the 21st of May, 1924, when Mr. and Mrs. Jacob Franks began a frantic search for their son, Bobby, 14 years old last seen only blocks from home. They were easily able to lure Bobby in the car because uh, they knew him. You know, he was a boy in the neighborhood. In fact, he used to come over and play tennis on Richard Loeb's tennis court. So it was not unusual for Richard to lean out the window and say, hey, Bobby, you want to ride home? So he was into the car and bang, within probably a matter of seconds and minutes, uh, he was struck over the head and brutally killed. In a city as callous to killing as they come, the death of Bobby Frank stabbed the hearts of the public, especially those in the upscale suburbs of Hyde Park and Kenwood, where murder only happened downtown. How could this happen? Um, murder was something that mm, poor people did, and particularly murder of a youngster by adolescence. It's incomprehensible, and at least I'm sure for the newer residents of, of Kenwood and Hyde Park, they thought they had left that behind in the old neighborhoods. I mean, not here, not by one of our own, of one of our own. That's the thing that horrified the world at the time. You know, it wasn't just another homicide case. It was a really outstanding, vicious act of random victimization for which the defendants felt absolutely no remorse. There was an awful lot of crime, especially in Chicago in the 1920s. There were gangland crimes. There were race-based crimes. Uh, there were spouses killing spouses, but you didn't expect to see uh, 18, 19 year old kids killing 14 year old kids on the way home from school. It was an unimaginable crime in 1920. In the 1920s, Chicago beat like the heart of America. Prohibition, speakeasies, and the resulting mob activity kept the streets alive and the rivals dead. 
Flappers flapped. The Great War was forgotten, and the coming Great Depression, unthinkable. 1920 Chicago is, is more than we see uh, on old film. It's more than herky-jerky movement, uh, grainy pictures. Um, this was a happening time. Chicago in the 1920s was one of, if not the greatest industrial city in the world. This means any number of things, not least of all it generated prosperity and the hope for prosperity. That's the upside. The downside is the anxiety, all of this change, all of this modernity engenders. Are we becoming too materialistic a society? And this then factors into the Loeb and Leopold case because you have working class Chicago looking at this great criminal case as something that um, the wealthy do. And this is, you know, the sins of too much wealth. You have to understand the city of Chicago is totally outraged. After all, this was the murder of a child, and it was a child murdered in a very gruesome and shocking way. And there was tremendous, tremendous animosity toward Loeb and Leopold. It was a hanging kind of atmosphere. Richard Lowe came from a very privileged background. His father was a vice president, Sears Roebuck. Um, they had chauffeurs, they had butlers, they had maids. Uh, he did not have to work, he knew that. He didn't have to do the sorts of things that many people his age had to do. He was popular and he was very handsome and had a lot of girlfriends. And the parents in the neighborhood, particularly the mothers, really adored Dick, and they would say to the kids, why can't you be more like Dick Loeb, you know, for, for any particular situation. The misguided mothers of Kenwood weren't the only ones who thought young Loeb an epitome of American youth. He published his own magazine at the age of nine and caught the attention of President Teddy Roosevelt, who expressed pride that young men of Loeb's stamp were growing up in America. A Loeb who was already captivated by crime. Richard Loeb had a fascination with crime that began very early on, as early as five, six, or seven years of age. He was fascinated by cops and robbers. He was fascinated by detective stories. And he began a life of petty crime early on. Late at night, he would pull uh, tabloid magazines and police gazette and, and a crime tabloids out from under his bed and read these things, well, these things that ultimately shaped his desires and his personality. So again, this became part of his game playing, and he was fascinated by that, and that was one of the reasons that led him into uh, wanting to commit a crime, so he could play around and become a part of a novel himself. If Loeb could be part of a novel, Nathan Leopold could have written the book and the movie. Leopold was a brilliant young man. Nathan Leopold was a genius, almost frighteningly so, with an IQ of 220. He had graduated uh, from high school uh, very young, had gone to the University of Chicago and came out of school at age 18, the youngest supposedly graduate from that school, just as Loeb supposedly was the youngest graduate from the University of Michigan. Very bright, much of a genius, uh, particularly in the area of birding. His bird watching expertise gained him national renown when, as a 15 year old, he discovered the Kirtland Warbler on a field trip to central Michigan. He had strange hobbies. I mean, he was, you know, strange in terms of a teenager. He had a large collection of bird specimens, he was into intellectual pursuits. Um, he had plans to uh, translate some, some uh, <laughs> Italian poetry of, of previous centuries, you know, and he was really intellectually out there. Leopold spoke 15 different languages, including Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. He was a reader, if not a disciple, of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nathan Leopold really had two obsessions. One obsession was Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the other obsession was Richard Loeb. He was very attracted to Nietzsche's suggestion that people um, who are great minds can rise above conventional morality, they're not bound by conventional morality. And I, I think Leopold was sort of fascinated by that notion, that notion of becoming the Superman. I think that Leopold was really madly in love with Loeb. Leopold was very taken with the Oscar Wilde writing, and he was very taken with uh, very romantic, uh, 
poetry, and to him Loeb was the apotheosis of the ideal person. He once said he was jealous of the very food and water that Loeb drank because that could get closer to him than he was able to do himself. People say opposites attract, and they were really opposite personalities, and they each had what the other one wanted. I mean, Dick was handsome and outgoing, and Leopold was reserved and intellectual, and uh, clearly, whatever it was that they saw in each other, they saw it in a big way. They took a friendship, if not a love affair, and extended it to form a deadly compact, committed to each other and to crime. Their crimes included vandalism, arson, and burglary at the University of Michigan. The theft of a typewriter from Loeb's old frat house would help seal their fate. On November 11th, 1923, Leopold and Loeb burglarized Zeta Beta Tau fraternity at the University of Michigan. In fact, Loeb's old fraternity it might be their first major crime. And they stole a few things, including a typewriter, some chains, uh, trivial things, really. Driving back to Chicago after the crime, the two of them got into a major fight, a, a lover's quarrel, you might say, over the fact that each felt the other had performed badly during the crime. By the time they got into Chicago, they had mended things and had agreed to a compact where if one wanted, wanted to do something, the other had to go along. They even came up with this phrase, for Robert's sake, which was the trigger that meant the other had to obey. Leopold was looking to Loeb for sexual favors. Loeb was looking to Leopold for help in plotting what would become the crime of the century. It was a complicated plan, perhaps not the crime of the century as they imagined it was, but it was a very complex, well thought out kidnapping plan that could very well have worked, but for a couple of problems. This was a crime that was in the mind of Richard Loeb as long as six months prior to the crime. It involved such things as coming up with aliases, opening up fictitious bank accounts, developing an elaborate scheme uh, by which ransom demands would be communicated and ultimately the money would be delivered. A degree of planning that sim simply wasn't seen very often. The part of the plan that excited them the most, especially Loeb, was selection of a victim. They spent hours discussing it, from random choice to family members. Pick the victim almost became a game with Leopold and Loeb. Anytime they got together for lunch, for coffee, driving around in the car, they considered various candidates for their crime. At one point, they even considered their fathers. Uh, Richard Loeb even proposed his younger brother, Tommy. They talked about various boys in the neighborhood, uh, even relatives. And uh, at one point, they even considered a girl, but uh, thought, well, maybe girls are too much watched to go after. Ultimately, the game plan and the real, this is what really captured the Chicago uh, imagination and it really people around the world was the horror of the victim being, uh, to them, incidental. They just went into the day itself and they didn't have a victim, chance. In fact, I think that was the most frightening thing about the crime was that it could have been anybody's child, it could have been your child. Loeb's notion of random victimization surfaced in articles he wrote as a child during the Great War. The First World War is very significant in terms of warfare because it's the first time that there was aerial bombs being dropped on villages and towns. And he wrote a little editorial called Humanity. And he discusses the ramifications of aerial warfare and of bombs and of innocent people, which he says women and children, on the ground getting killed. And this seems to be where his concepts of random victimization uh, may have developed. Several weeks before the murder, they triggered their plan. Loeb went to the bank, withdrew $100. They got a suitcase, filled it full of books so it weighed a little bit, looked legitimate. Went down to a hotel, checked into a room to establish a, an address. Went to a rental car company, rented a car briefly, 
just to establish their credit with that company and then checked out. And two weeks later, they came back, rented the car, and they were off and running in their murder. They brought the car down to their neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. And sometime in the afternoon, began cruising around the neighborhood of the Harvard School for Boys, sometimes parking the car, talking to students, looking for a likely victim. At that point, they didn't have any specific victim in mind. It was about five, a little after five, perhaps, in the afternoon, when the boys had the car in a position near the Harvard School for Boys and saw a young kid, one that Richard Loeb recognized, a boy named Bobby Frank, who had just finished umpiring a baseball game, who was on his way home from school to his house about three blocks away. At that point, Richard Loeb motioned for Bobby Franks to come over to their car. He said he wanted to show them a tennis racket. Loeb and Franks had played tennis in the past. So naturally, Franks came over to the car. They lured him into the car, into the front seat, certainly. He was hit over the head almost immediately with the chisel, dragged into the back seat. A etherized rag was stuffed in his mouth. If he wasn't killed by the blows of the chisel, certainly the suffocation finished off the job, and Bobby Franks was dead and bleeding in the back seat of the car. It was still daylight. Uh, the crime was committed in the late afternoon, and at that time of year in Chicago, the sun would still be up for several hours. So they drove around, even stopped at the uh, Do Drop In, I think was the name of the little hot dog stand in the Hammond to get a bite to eat. After dinner, they headed out of town, stripping items off the body as they drove. By a desolate stretch of road, they buried Bobby's belt and boots. They were one step away from burying the body. Leopold thought that he had a good place to put this body. Colbert south part of town near where he frequently birded. They took the body out of the car, stripped it naked, and poured hydrochloric acid over the body of Bobby Franks. They hoped the hydrochloric acid would disfigure the body to the extent that it wouldn't be easily recognizable. They stuffed the body head first into a culvert, collected Bobby's bloody clothes, and drove back to the city. At one point, they stopped the car to call up the Franks family, Jacob Franks, and tell them that their boy had been kidnapped and that they could expect a further communication in the future relating to a ransom demand. They added the Franks address to the previously typed ransom note and mailed it. They returned back to the Hyde Park neighborhood, tried to wash out the car as best they could. There were blood stains all over. It wasn't an easy job. Uh, and then retired. And for the next couple of days, to the extent that it was possible, and it was really almost unimaginable that they could, they carried on a relatively normal existence, going to school, doing the things that they would be expected to do. Just as plotting the murder had been a game to them, so was how to collect the ransom money. That was sort of the end point of the game. And it became almost a scavenger hunt. They were going to send poor Jacob Frank scurrying all over the neighborhood uh, to this uh, drugstore, to that train station. He was supposed to board a train, find a note in the box in the back of the train. Uh, he would have the money in a cigar box that had to be sealed with wax. And at a certain point, a certain factory, he would throw the money uh, out the window and Leopold and Loeb uh, would walk off uh, $10,000 richer. Of course, they didn't need the money. It was really more a comedy of errors, however. The perfect crime unraveled like a cheap sweater. Ransom only works if the victim is alive. As early as the morning after the body was disposed of, a construction worker happened to notice part of a body sticking out of that swamp. And soon the body was extracted, and it was determined that it was, in fact, Bobby Franks. At that point, the perfect plan was no longer 
close to being the perfect crime. Immediately after the murder, everybody became a suspect in the city of Chicago. Could have been anybody. Police had no idea. They were sort of floundering in all directions. And what was even worse, the newspaper reporters were floundering with them, trying to seek out leads, trying to be the first one to identify the murder. They pulled a couple of uh, teachers from the Harvard School in. They grilled them relentlessly. They were certain that one of them was involved. You know, hints of perversion were involved. Hints of drugs were involved, and all this time, Leopold and Loeb were reading the newspapers and laughing. Dick's behavior after he committed the crime what indicates that uh, that he that in a way he was looking to get caught. He hung around with the reporters. He uh, was in the face of the cops and the detectives investigating. He was all over the Frank's house and the Harvard School, and, and he made himself extremely accessible. Um, not like somebody who commits a crime and doesn't want people to know that he did it. I mean, he even took them to the drugstore where Franks was supposed to have uh, received the telephone call. He made a comment to them, if I were going to murder anybody, it would be a cocky little kid just like that Bobby Franks. It was sort of like he was running in front of the bulls, dodging their, their horns, uh, uh, f flailing out with the red cape, but ducking it away and letting the bull charge on uh, beyond him. Leopold, in the meantime, was sort of sitting back watching the scientists, watching almost objectively as this act went on around them, trying to figure out whether they actually would catch them. And at one point, he made the statement that, uh, you know, he might have killed Bobby Franks just like a scientist might impinge a beetle on the end of a pin. You know, taking a human life means nothing to him. The master plan included the alibi that Leopold and Loeb had spent the day of the murder drinking and cruising in Leopold's Red Willie's Night for what they called chippies, or girls. They thought there'd be no way in which the police investigators would be led to them as possible suspects. Unbeknownst to them, however, there was a pair of glasses found with the Bobby Frank's body. Tracing them to their owner was simple detective work. Leopold thought there had to be zillions, in his word, of these glasses out there in the city of Chicago. In fact, it was a relatively common prescription. His problem, however, was that the glasses had an unusual hinge, a hinge that only was found on the pairs of three glasses sold in the city of Chicago. Leopold's explanation that he had dropped the glasses while bird watching didn't convince investigators. They asked him to fall several times with the glasses in his pocket. They didn't fall out. The glasses tied Leopold to the crime scene, but they wouldn't secure a conviction. For that, at least a couple other things had to fall into place, and they did. One of them was the discovery of a document that Leopold had produced in connection with his law school classes at the University of Chicago. It turned out after those papers were examined that the typewriting on those sheets matched that on the ransom notes. Illinois State's attorney, Robert Crow, personally ran the investigation. Despite increasing evidence of guilt, Crow deferred to the family's wealth, power, and status. They were interrogated in hotels rather than in the Cook County Jail or in the state's attorney's office, and they were treated with some deference, on the surface at least. They were going to be questioned uh, regardless of the, of the fact that it's 3 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the morning. But they were handled with kid gloves. Leopold and Loeb were treated uh, very well. In his explanation of what he was doing on Wednesday, May 21st, Nathan Leopold said that he and Richard Loeb were driving around in their own vehicle. Later on, Nathan Leopold's chauffeur came to the prosecutor with a bit of information that he thought perhaps might actually clear Nathan Leopold, and that was that their vehicle was being serviced that day. It was in the garage. It was not out on the roads. Could he prove it? The state's attorney wanted to know. 
Yes, indeed he could. It turned out that that very day he had gotten a prescription filled and could mark that day by that prescription. By God, I think I've got them, Robert Crow was said to have said. The cruising for girls alibi was a proven lie. Crow attacked Loeb first. He folded like a pleated skirt and admitted guilt, blaming Leopold for the murder. Confronted, Leopold fingered Loeb. The confession stunned the nation and fed a national media uproar. Everybody followed that case. I mean, that case was written about in the New York Times, the LA Times, the New Republic. Even in France, F. Scott Fitzgerald followed that case very carefully. He read about it and he was totally fascinated by the fact that these two young men from a wealthy background had committed this shocking crime. Leopold and Lowe became a real morality tale for the Chicago press because it allowed the newspapers to um, explore the question of change and um, whether or not Chicagoans had gotten too far uh, from traditional values and had embraced too much modernity, too many material goods. And so periodically you'll, you'll get a sense in the papers that these people had been immoral, they had been too modern, they had not been brought up in the faith of our fathers. Newspapers played on this. They knew that a good story would sell newspapers. And they saw in this trial a lot of the elements of a very good story. They exploited it to the fullest. At one point, um, the Tribune wanted to use its new radio station, WGN, to actually cover the trial live. Um, ultimately, this, for a number of reasons, didn't pan out, but at one point there was even talk about moving the trial proceedings out of the courthouse and into a baseball park, this being Comiskey Park, the home of the White Sox. This meant that you would have had, possibly, witnesses going up to uh, the pitcher's mound to, to, to swear in and then um, watching, looking out into the stands and seeing that there were now 22 to 24,000 spectators. The Loeb and Leopold families shook off a stunned silence to appeal to America's acknowledged legal wizard, Clarence Darrow. Darrow was known as the best criminal lawyer in America. He was attracted to the Leopold and Loeb defense because it gave him a platform to further his own opposition to the death penalty. Initial public reaction was rolled eyes and snide comments about America's wealthy buying America's best, the million dollar defense. That provided Darrow with his first move. He had the Leopold and Loeb families write letters to the editor, explaining to them that Clarence Darrow would be representing them for no more than the standard fee for this type of a trial. By squashing the first media rumor, Darrow took control of the trial coverage, but the task ahead of him seemed impossible. By the time Darrow was brought into the case, the boys had already given the state's attorney a full confession. And Darrow was really faced with what appeared to be an open and shut case against him, that the DA had a confession, he was ready to go. And the district attorney, or the state's attorney, was a very tough guy. He was definitely out to hang those kids. Robert Crow was a Yale Law School graduate a respected Republican and a former judge. He was a determined investigator who ran a first-class prosecuting team and was regarded as a credible and suitable match for Darrow. The boys were facing two charges. One was kidnapping, one was murder. Both in 1924 in Illinois were capital crimes, meaning that the prosecutor had an option. If he failed to get the death sentence he was seeking in the first case, he could try them again on the second. Darrow knew that and forced Crow's and the judge's hand by pleading his clients guilty as charged. Everyone expected Darrow to go in front of a jury and use his marvelous talents to sway the jury to acquit the boys, but he realized that that was an impossibility. So what he did was he waived a jury trial, he entered a plea of guilty, and then he had the court listen to his evidence in mitigation of the crime which was, of course, was a brilliant maneuver, and it was one that took the state's attorney totally by surprise. So at that point, Darrow was just really pleading for the boys' lives. As well as a fight against the death penalty, Leopold and Loeb's trial introduced something called alienists to the trial process. 
One of the landmark aspects of this case is that uh, the use of forensic psychiatry, and the doctors were called alienists at the time, they weren't even called psychiatrists. It was a landmark in making people comprehend that mental condition, and whether you want to use the word insanity or crazy or um, just what ultimately became the mitigating circumstances involving the mental condition of the defendants, there's just a huge gray area, gray matter you might even say, that things were not in this world black and white. It was just the beginnings of comprehending that in 1924. One sort of footnote to this story that I think is kind of fascinating is that William Randolph Hearst had taken an interest in it and had apparently tried on his own to contact Sigmund Freud to see if he might be brought over to the United States to investigate as a psychiatrist Leopold and Loeb. At the time, though, he was too ill to make the trip and that possibility fell through. At the request of the defense, Leopold and Loeb were sequestered for two weeks, high in the Cook County Courthouse, where they were subjected to the most intensive psychiatric and physical evaluation ever conducted. They spent hours evaluating these people, evaluating their childhood, evaluating their sexual impulses, evaluating their lives in crime, evaluating all aspects of their personality and their relationship with each other. Findings revealed both boys had been abused emotionally or sexually by governesses, resulting in abnormal fantasies, suicidal tendencies, and the emotional maturity of children. But Darrow's play for sympathy was working. Clarence Darrow's idea in using forensic psychiatrists or alienists as they were called at the time was that he wanted to humanize his clients. He wanted the public he wanted the judge to understand these two boys as completely as they possibly could. The more that they were understood, the less they would be perceived as animals or monsters and as sympathetic human beings who deserved at least a fair shot. The 80,000 word evaluation called Leopold emotionally detached and paranoid. Loeb apparently suffered from a pathologically split personality. The psychiatrists uh, all testify, both for the defense and for the prosecution, that they don't believe that they, uh, either defendant would have committed the crime without the other. Crow introduced dozens of witnesses for the period centered around the 21st of May, 1924, the day of the murder. He wanted to impress the judge with the severity of the crime and the impact on the Franks family, rather than the psychiatric flim-flam. Being a great trial strategist, Darrow knew enough not to cross-examine some witnesses. He did not fight it as though it were a not guilty case. He banked on the psychiatrists convincing the judge that the boys should live, that they were disturbed, that they were sick, that they were unusual, that they were weird, all the terms that Darrow used throughout the course of the trial. Basically, Clarence Darrow tried to blame everybody except Leopold and Loeb for this crime. He tried to blame their parents, he tried to blame their genes, he tried to blame dead German philosopher, he tried to blame World War I, he tried to blame detective stories, he tried to blame society as a whole. And the ever-hungry press, begging for quotes and headlines, went wild. The reporters of that time had a field day because, of course, Leopold was, uh, I wouldn't say a very colorful person, but he was a very unique individual. He was a very brilliant, very arrogant, very self-centered young man. And so his quotes to the press were really uh, kind of music to their ears, and they played that angle up. And of course, Loeb was a very good-looking, very charming, very smooth young fellow, and so the press played up that angle. They were enormously, uh, you know, I hate to use the word, but popular. I mean, they were celebrities, and they would, would receive notes from women all over the country, I don't know, possibly the world. I mean, letters came in by the sackful, uh, women making passes at them. Dickie Loeb was good-looking. He had money. You know, what more could a nice-looking female want? Of course, he'd murdered somebody. That was besides the point. But the women seemed to flock into the courtroom. They would try to pass notes to... Uh, Dickie Loeb, and of course he played up to that, to the hilt. He was always a ladies' man. He slicked his hair back in that Valentino look that was popular. They were able to uh, uh, sit 
uh, without emotion and and certain times uh, when perhaps somebody else would have would have been devastated that they were able to laugh and they were able to joke and they were really emotionally removed from the reality that they were facing the gallows Darrow's closing arguments before Judge Caverly focused on the teenage twosome's tender years. Clarence Darrow's summation in the Leopold and Loeb trial is sometimes referred to as the best summation in American courtroom history. It's eloquent, it's poetic in places, it's a very moving piece of literature. In fact, at the end of the 12-hour summation, Judge Caverly was said to have had tears streaming down his cheeks. Not a bad sign, perhaps. Prosecutor Robert Crowe had the final word, calling the crime the most atrocious, brutal, and cowardly murder in the history of American jurisprudence. He demanded their execution in the name of righteousness in America. I think it was Darrow who actually said during the course of the trial, and he told Judge Caverly that Crowe had tried the case as though that it would break his heart if the boys did not die. On the 10th of September, 1924, Judge John Caverly, after 21 days' deliberation, returned to the Cook County Courthouse with sentences of life imprisonment for the murder of Bobby Franks, plus 99 years for the capital kidnapping charge. Caverly cited their youth and said that it was inappropriate to execute the boys. Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb were soon marched to separate prisons. Harmless alone, together they were regarded as deadly. But in 1931, after six years apart, Leopold and Loeb were reunited. Together again, they reverted to their academic partnership, establishing a correspondence school for prisoners. Both of them taught. But despite their positive prison records, they were unrepentant. Years later in prison, on the anniversary of the crime, Loeb would insist that he and Leopold got together, and Loeb would have Leopold and, and himself relive the crime. They would describe it and Loeb would just be so taken with the anniversary and the events. That was a thrilling uh, undertaking for him. Three years later, murder revisited the brothers in blood. Richard Loeb was found on the prison shower floor, bleeding from 56 razor wounds. Although doubted by the warden, cell neighbor James Day claimed Loeb approached him for a sexual encounter. At 30 years of age, handsome Dickie Loeb died in the arms of Nathan Leopold, the man who loved him. You know, one thing about history is that it's written by survivors. And once Loeb was dead and the years ticked by, uh, Leopold did see that there could possibly be a light at the end of the tunnel, that he stood a chance to be paroled. As the lone survivor of the deadly compact, Leopold set out to reinvent himself. He studied Egyptian hieroglyphics. He corresponded with Albert Einstein. He increased his 15 languages to 27, and he did everything possible to push for parole. Behind the towering walls of the State Bill Prison at Joliet, Illinois, hope for the blind is held out by inmates who have offered to donate one or both of their eyes at time of death. Nathan Leopold, condemned for the slaying of Robert Franks 20 years ago, is a volunteer in a cause that deserves universal support. By World War II, um, uh, the government was conducting uh, malaria experiments in order to, to look for a cure for, you know, fevers that were killing people in the jungles, etc. And prisoners would volunteer to be human guinea pigs. Volunteer prisoners would receive a reduced sentence. Leopold, by participating, had his sentence reduced from 99 to 85 years, making parole a possibility by the 50s. In the mid-1950s, uh, a reporter did a series, a four-part series on Nathan Leopold, and it was one of the opportunities that Leopold had to recreate his public image, and there was a, a whole photographic essay that showed a paunchy, middle-aged, 
retired man that was not the Nathan Leopold that people remembered, who went into prison as a cocky, arrogant 19-year-old. So here was this opportunity to uh, go through the litany of all the good things that he was able to accomplish in prison and the volunteer work and the school and the malaria experiments and create a case for his parole. Leopold wrote an autobiography called Life Plus 99 Years. The book didn't address the murder of Bobby Franks, but was designed to rebuild his image with a public who may have forgotten his crime. His campaign worked. He became the poster boy for prisoner rehab. Poet Carl Sandburg and crime writer Earl Stanley Gardner were among those who rallied to his cause. He was a, a counterculture hero, I suppose you might call him, just as many of our prisoners have uh, become counterculture heroes today. So the famous would flock to him, uh, the Carl Sandbergs, the people like that. After three failed attempts at getting paroled, Leopold was granted a fourth hearing in 58. He was represented by Chicago attorney Elmer Gertz. No stranger to controversy, Gertz had defended author Henry Miller and would represent Jack Ruby, assassin of Kennedy killer Lee Harvey Oswald. He had to satisfy the board as to why he committed the crime, and he said, he said he had the intelligence of a man of genius and the emotions of a savage. Uh, that, that the emotions were led to the, and he was infatuated with uh, Loeb. Lo you, you know, he still cherished Loeb, even though he realized Loeb was the architect of his ruination. Nathan Leopold became a free man 34 years after incarceration and on the 20th anniversary of Clarence Darrow's death. The media frenzy, still warm a generation later, blew hot that day. Prison yard was full of reporters. I appeal as solemnly as I know how to you and to your editors and to your publishers and to society at large to agree that the only piece of news about me is that I have ceased to be news. Leopold flew to Puerto Rico to work as a hospital technician. There, he wrote about birds, got a master's degree in mathematics, and continued to promote himself as an international celebrity. One of the advantages to Leopold's celebrity status was that he traveled all over the world, and he uh, met with a great many people of influence and acclaim, and he was uh, pursued by all kinds of people of renown all over the world to be in their company, you know, to go to parties and to go to dinner and to exchange correspondence. And he, he had a damn good time of it. Leopold's new life, new self-image, new attempts to sell himself as a rational seeker of truth demanded the trappings of normality, including a wife. Part of Leopold's genius was to let them think that he was somebody who he was not. His friends in Chicago, the people who viewed him as a great symbol of rehabilitation and the person who had been conned into this uh, caper by Loeb, was very different from the Nathan Leopold who lived kind of a very dark life in some respects. That dark side included illegal drug experimentation and illicit sex in the back alleys of San Juan. Publicly, he became a crusader against capital punishment, offering himself as a model of rehabilitation. You've been very kind in saying that you think that some of the work I've been doing recently is of some value. Obviously, I couldn't be doing it if I'd been executed in 1924. So it seems to me a sequitur that uh, here is an example of a man who might well have been executed who wasn't, and now we're glad we didn't. Why did you and Richard Loeb kill Bobby Franks? I'd rather not answer. Can you give us no insight into that? I'm not going to. Nathan enjoyed being a celebrity. He certainly enjoyed his 15 minutes of fame. And American society is very strange that way, a way in which criminals suddenly become celebrities or movie stars become superheroes. And Nathan was very much 
part of that cultural stream. And he used that status to bootstrap himself into a noted criminologist or a noted speaker on the issues of crime and capital punishment. And really, he wasn't any of those things. He was just, you know, someone who had been a very promising, very brilliant University of Chicago student who very tragically destroyed his life. And in some respects, it seems to be almost the beginning of the disintegration of our society. You have these two young men who had everything to live for, who basically self-destructed. And for me, that uh, seems to be a metaphor for this century and our society. Nathan Leopold died of heart failure in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1971 at age 66. He left his eyes to science. I doubt they gave us any insight into his dark soul. The names and places change, but the horror is always the same when kids form a deadly compact and seal it with the blood of the innocent.